welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ranjan Naik. Uh, I'm the founding trustee and the business ambassador for the Blue Economy Hub. I uh, welcome you all uh, to the second episode of our webinar uh, series uh, titled Opportunities in the Blue Economy, uh, where we go around the world uh, finding opportunities for collaboration in the many uh, in the many industry verticals of the blue economy. Uh, this episode is uh, sponsored by uh, Buoyancy Consultants from uh, Goa in India. And uh, it's a company that specialized in ship and offshore design. So if, if you are in interested of those services, please do get in touch with them. Uh, I will now I would like to introduce my panel today. Yes. So I have a distinguished uh, panel uh, today, and uh, they are all from Africa or the IORA, the Indian Ocean Rim Association member countries. And uh, Professor Narnia Mueller, uh, Dr. Francis Onditi uh, joins us from Kenya. Uh, Professor Narnia is from South Africa. And I think uh, Mr. Dini Mohammed is having some issues connecting, but whenever he is uh, ready to join, uh, he will be available. Uh, he's getting in and out of, of connection. So maybe there's some issues there. Uh, to begin uh, with, I think uh, what I will do is, uh, I will just play a video so that um, whoever, uh, like anybody of our guests or our listeners who are unaware of the blue economy, so they are they get accustomed to the the topic with what we are going to discuss, and then uh, we can start our discussions. Okay, uh, just to remind you that the the video is not our own video. I got this. I saw this video on YouTube. It's by the United Nations. So let's have a look at it together, and uh, and then we will have a discussion on that. Excellent. Was that clear? Yeah, that was nice. OK. So I will just turn on all the microphones. Uh, uh, can you turn on all your microphones if you are, if you can hear me? Yeah. Because I. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear, I can hear you loud and clear. So um, uh, welcome, uh, Dini. Uh, 
we were waiting for you. Nice that you could. We can't hear you. Maybe your microphone is is muted. Uh, can you hear us, uh, Doctor Unditi? Hello, hello. How do you yeah. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear now, Dini. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you, thank yeah. you all of you. Yeah, Doctor Unditi, are you loud and uh, can can you hear us? Uh, I, I can't hear you. Try uh, turn on your microphone. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yeah, I can hear loud and clear now. Okay. So uh, I think that we can begin the discussion, and uh, I would I would be very I would encourage you to ask each other questions, and uh, and and uh, we can begin by asking one 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 small question: Is how uh, how how mature is the subject in your in your country, uh, the the blue economy subject? I mean, uh, you Narnia and uh, Dr. Onditi are both from the academia. Uh, I think that's the place where all these discussions begin. Uh, how 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 is the, the how mature is the subject, Narnia? Okay, um, so it's become far more popular, if I can say, um, in South Africa over the past um, decade or so, mm. um, and it's because it's a, a relatively new concept internationally. Um, so, in 2014, uh, government decided to create something called an oceans lab uh, through a process called Operations Pakisa. Um, Pakisa in local lingo means hurry up um, or big fast results. Yeah. And um, what the oceans lab or Operation Pakisa did was start to create awareness around um, job creation and investment opportunities related to the ocean. So it's located in the Department of Environmental Affairs. Um, but unfortunately, um, Operation Pakisa is far more focused on, on exploitation um, than it is on sustainability. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that later. Um, but because of our involvement as chair of um, the Indian Ocean Rim Association from 2017 to 2019, South Africa's main focus in Iora um, was actually on the blue economy. And uh, we managed to create working group in the region um, on the blue economy. So it's considered to be very important but there are different uh, kinds of perspectives around um, what the blue economy is and what the oceans economy is. But that is really academic though, um, because uh, I think that predominantly because we, we need to focus on the United Nations and you've just shown the video, um, United Nations is looking at sustainability in terms of the sustainable development goals so goal 14 is uh, about life under the ocean, but it's also related to every other goal that there is. Um, so I don't think that we can look at the oceans without considering inclusive and sustainable yeah. developments um, as we're, we're facing a climate change crisis. Um, so it's, it's being spoken about and it's being debated constantly in South Africa and in the region in Africa as well as in the Indian Ocean region. Yeah. Dr. Onditi, you want to add uh, on that? Yeah. Um, thank you very much, uh, Nike, for this opportunity. But I think um, our case in Kenya and East African region in particular may not be significantly different from what um, uh, Professor Nania just uh, described uh, from the South African region. But I think what really uh, activated um, the debate about blue economy in Eastern Africa uh, was the 2018 uh, conference that Kenya co-hosted with the Are we having some connection issues there? There were quite a number of diverse issues, but also the people who attended the institution. Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yes. Uh, you can hear me. The thing is, um, 
the 2018 conference that happened that was co-hosted between Kenya and Canada in 2018 was quite uh, a big thing. Uh, it, it actually helped to establish the appetite. Uh, but I can say traditionally the um, partly because um, it, it is a new emerging area in terms of utilization, but, but also, um, you know, in terms of framing, it is something that, in my view, it is still a work in progress. Uh, for example, um, you realize that, uh, you know, uh, many countries still um, feel like, all right, uh, so when we talk about exploitation of the blue economy, many people would think about, uh, you know, fisheries, yet we've got so many other things that can be an economy that many countries don't even put in into their visions, they don't put into their strategies, and even when they plan around it, it is just one of the subsector that uh, they try to, uh, you know, to integrate. Uh, so, yeah, it, it is uh, an area that is coming with a lot of, um, you know, interest. Uh, we hope that in years to come, uh, and especially when we academics and researchers, we continue to unveil some of the uh, interests, like the book we are just editing, um, you know, Professor Nanya is part of it. Um, it is something that we hope uh, once it is out, um, you know, people can continue to build uh, interest around this area. We can also use the same uh, platform to influence different universities and also advise the governments on, on how to uh, relook re at the blue economy um, in terms of uh, policy development, uh, but also in terms of utilization of enormous resources that are within our borders. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Dini, want to want to say something yeah. on uh, on the maturity of the subject in uh, in Somalia? Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, for thank you very much for your invitation. Also, I want to and uh, to send my best regarding to them to my colleagues. Uh, as we are East Africa and Somalia, it has the longest and. Uh, coastline. It is estimated about the 3,300 kilometers. So we can say that and we have a lot of opportunities and for the sake of blue economy. So as my friend said that in a 2018 conference, our government has and uh, really and uh, emphasizes the opportunities of this blue economy. Mm. So as we are East Africa, we have a lot of potentials for the blue economy. So we have a lot of opportunities, really. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I'll come to the, from academia, let's move into a little bit onto the business side of things. And uh, then we come to the, to the main question there is, is has, has anything been identified? Has your government identified any strategic areas uh, in the blue economy in the, in the short term, Narnia? Um, yeah, so the Oceans Lab identified various sectors, um, mm -hmm. and some have been developed uh, more than others. So uh, the sectors are uh, marine transport and manufacturing, as well as small harbors. Um, so there has been some development there, um, except there, there, there was also some controversy around where the small harbors were being built. Um, because of, of heritage and, and issues like that that are very important to take into consideration. The area that we've been most focused on is probably the one that is the most controversial, which is oil and gas exploration. Um, but of course, there's a lot of money in this and um, South Africa's economic situation is not good. I think we're all facing um, problems now because of COVID-19. Um, but the oil and gas uh, exploitation and exploration um, aspect of the ocean's economy is, has been um, focused on very much by government. Um, then aquaculture as well. 
um, you know, developing both freshwater and seawater um, aquaculture, and that's mainly to focus on job creation, but also food security. Um, and that is something that we, we are also very concerned about. Um, and marine planning uh, is, is also something that is focused on as well as oceans governance. So marine spatial planning, um, those kinds of issues, and lastly, tourism. So there's a lot of focus also by the Department of Tourism on um, what we can do uh, as South Africa and within the region um, to encourage coastal tourism. And one of the, the focal areas was actually cruise tourism. But um, considering what we've seen now in the last uh, two or three months around uh, cruises and the, um, the very quick spread of diseases, um, we, we may have to shift um, our attention uh, to other forms of coastal tourism. Um, our, our tourism is actually uh, being uh, closed. Our, our borders are being closed until December of this year, and um, that might last longer. So that initiative, that um, sort of drive that uh, was happening has come to a bit a standstill. Uh, but those are the main areas uh, that, that the South African government um, is interested in. Uh, slightly different from um, the Indian Ocean Rim Association. So you can see there are different sectors that people recognize as important. Um, so with the Indian Ocean Rim Association, one of the sectors that isn't mentioned um, in South Africa as a priority is fisheries. Um, and uh, that's also got to do with uh, uh, regulating um, overfishing, as well as uh, renewable ocean energy. Uh, and renewable ocean energy is really important, but it's not an area um, that South Africa has been focusing on. And I would actually encourage governments to, to look at that more closely because there's a, a lot of potential around um, renewable energy and renewable ocean energy, which would help us not to focus too much on the oil and gas uh, exploitation, which is quite bad for the environment. Um, so those are the, the main um, focus points that South Africa is looking at at the moment. Yeah. Dr. Onditi? Ah, okay. Um, I guess the case uh, or the picture in East Africa, particularly in Kenya, um, he, you know, he, he, it's, it's, it's not very, very different uh, from what we see across the continent. However, as Ali said, um, the 2018 conference was a great milestone. And uh, since then, we've seen quite a lot of uh, things happening in terms of policy, um, strategic development, uh, but also uh, envisioning uh, what to do uh, with our blue economy ecosystem. Um, but it's very unfortunate that uh, whereas we know that 80% of the, the, the global uh, trade volume is, is actually uh, done by the sea and the ships, not been exploited quite a lot in East Africa. Uh, you know, uh, the best, uh, the, the, the best you can you, you can think of in terms of connecting and linking the global trade um, is is none other than you know the blue economy or exploiting the opportunities within the blue economy. Um, I would say this in terms of the strategies that have been developed uh, in Kenya and in the region as far as the blue economy is concerned. Um, the Western, what we call the Western Indian Ocean region, it has an opportunity or it has a potential of 22 billion uh, US assets that are available for countries to exploit like Kenya but um, utilizes about 4 point, uh, I think 4.4% 4 
Uh, we can't hear you, Dr. Anditi. Uh, we have lost you there. Yeah. Okay, then yeah. When, when we come back, we will hear from him. Uh, Dini, we, uh, yes. you would like to it's tell just us? Just about uh, 20. Okay. Dini, you want to tell us uh, about the situation in, in Somalia? Like, which are the industry verticals that you are looking at? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And much of it was. Okay. Yeah, you can tell us, Dini. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, really, and, uh, we have, and, uh, as I told, the biggest and, uh, cost in Africa. It is about 330, 330, uh, 3,300 kilometers. So we have, we have a lot of opportunities. Uh, first of all, we have planned a national development plan, which is uh, developing and, uh, the uh, blue economy. So we have planned a uh, lot of projects, especially a fishing harvest, fishing cast, and uh, board and uh, and building is also we have an uh, aquaculture mm. so there's a lot of opportunities in our country although uh, it needs a lot of investments mm. so also we are barbarian and marine biotechnical and also and uh, there's opportunity for the energy and oil and gas so there's a lot of an uh, opportunity in somalia Okay, and is the is the security situation uh, like conducive for that kind of investments right now? Because I, I, I mean, last last week when I was speaking to you, you said things are different in Somalia now compared to the last four five years. How how is how is that? I mean, how can you convince uh, the international community to to do uh, investments in Somalia? Yeah, and uh, as the government has planned a national development plan, it is part uh, of the government government plan. Uh, to enforce the security in order and okay. uh, to enhance the investments. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, are you yeah. able to hear me now? Yeah, Doctor Onditi, we are we are we are able to hear you now. Yes, please go I'm ahead. I'm hoping that I will not be lost again. <laughs> no. uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, the point I was trying to make is that um, there are quite a lot of opportunities that exist. The challenge is uh, you know bridging the gap. For example. The 22 billion US dollar uh, that is ocean, um, whereas Kenya only utilizes about 20 uh, percent. That is 4.4 billion. And if you look at it critically, you realize that uh, uh, much of it goes to tourism. Uh, so obviously, tourism is is a priority because it takes 4.1 billion US dollar as part of the asset um, of the. Uh, the blue economy, uh, you know, opportunities that exist. But then um, there is also the exploitation of the, you know, the mining, uh, which is also very important, the marine mining, um, not very much developed because it requires uh, quite a sophisticated technology. Uh, but there is also the energy, um, you know, generation. Um, and all these three things have been embedded within the, the Kenyan vision. Uh, or rather what we call the the agenda, the four agenda, the four big agenda, you know, under industrialization, the president and, um, you know, uh, the different sectors have been asked to mainstream those three areas, uh, focusing on the, on the blue economy. But I think uh, also, um, you know, the issue of uh, how do you ensure that uh, the assets, resources, and activities around the blue economy, uh, they are in tandem with the modern technology, is, is obviously an issue that uh, the government will continue to tackle, not just the Kenyan government, but also the neighboring countries. Because on one hand, uh, there is a lot of appetite, as I said, for governments to exploit the blue economy ecosystem. But on the other side, the required facilities, the connectivity that is required uh, for the government to exploit um, becomes a bit challenging. 
Um, the point I wanted to make is that, uh, and and this is what we found in our in our research. Um, you know, for for the for the works that we continue to do, um, many the notion that uh, blue economy can absolutely be anchored on environmental sustainability is a good thing. But our research is finding is is contesting that in, in that. Uh, you know there are other issues that are important and, and and one of the things that we are recommending strongly for governments is uh, looking at blue economy in in a more of what we call the maritime diplomacy the maritime diplomacy uh because you realize that uh, the more, more the countries continue to exploit the blue economy resources the more tensions continues to Correct. occur. Correct. Now the question is uh, existing in countries, yet the, the blue economy framework does you know, uh, tell you that, uh, uh, for example, um, you know, if, if we didn't have the IOR, the, you know, the Indian Ocean Rim, um, some of the disputes that uh, that exist, you know, between countries, for example, between Kenya and Somalia, can easily escalate into, um, you know, challenges that uh, countries, will, you know, will not be able to, to bear. And so our strong recommendations uh, to governments is relooking at the conceptualization of, of the blue economy economy and, and try to see how to think on the environmental sustainability which is important but then we have to broaden that uh, okay and, and so that we can be exploited the blue economy yeah yeah yeah, I think uh, you brought in that right my next right uh, question about sustainability I mean there are there is a conflict, inherent conflict between the two discourse of growth and development against protection of ocean resources. Uh, Narnia, how, how is your government addressing that part? Um, well, as I mentioned, uh, with regards to um, what we call the oceans economy, um, the main focus is really uh, job creation and economic growth. Uh, so that is a priority for the South African government and has been for a while for obvious reason. Um, but we are moving more towards uh, looking at um, the United Nations uh, goals because we also have to ensure that we meet those goals as everybody else. And we have a decade in which to do that. Um, so this de this next decade of the United Nations is called the Decade of um, Ocean Science for Sustainability um, and for Sustainable Development. So we have to find a balance between um, the the exploitation, the development side of it, but also inclusive um, development as well as sustainable development. And it's been proven to be possible. I mean, um, the, the, the point is if we overfish, we are going to end up not having any food to eat from the oceans. Um, and this is something that is of tremendous concern. Um, we also are facing the acidification of the oceans. The oceans are heating. Um, and because of the pollution and the issues of climate change. Um, so we have to think of future generations um, when it comes to this and try and find solutions to these problems. And one of them is really an, an interesting one I, I read about was that some cargo ships are actually also now taking on a responsibility for oceanographic research, for determining where the pollution hotspots are, um, and trying to do some, some serious science around um, what's going on in the oceans. So you, you transporting your cargo and simultaneously you're contributing something towards the research around the oceans. And I think that's a, a brilliant idea and it, it can be done in so many good ways. Um, and the it is true, as Francis said, that um, 
sustainability is not the only issue and we've come to realize as well that safety and security marine and maritime safety and security are essential um, for the blue economy to actually work um, so that is that is something that's become very important in order to let's say regulate um, people fishing in your uh, zone um, and those kinds of things, those kinds of tensions that exist, um, looking at marine spatial planning in a regional way rather than merely local. Okay. Um, and some, some countries in the Indian Ocean actually are sharing their um, the EEZs, uh, their zones and, and uh, reaching agreements. So, uh, that's another thing that's important. The Indian Ocean Rim Association is a consensus-based body with 22 member states around the um, the Indian Ocean Rim. Um, and uh, every um, year, senior officials and ministers get together to discuss these issues. And if we didn't do that, I think there'd be far more problems um, in, in the region than there are now. Um, so that kind of dialogue is of absolute essence. Um, and we also then know that the Af African Union also has maritime policies um, and the focus on um, women entering into these spaces as well is very important. Before before I go to my uh, maybe Dini wants to say something. Oh yeah, uh, Onditi, Doctor Onditi wants to say something. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, Professor Nanya mentioned something important. You know, in, in terms of the regional interconnectivity. Um, I wonder how Iora, for example, um, would be able to uh, to activate um, you know the regional inter interconnectivity in terms of trade. But also in terms of uh, dealing with the disputes, you know, uh, resolving disputes that may occur. Uh, I know Kenya is a member of the IORA. I'm not sure about Somalia. I think it is. It is. Um, if if both of them are members, which I know, um, there could be an opportunity to deal with the um, with the maritime disputes that uh, you know that keep on arising all the time. But I think the point I wanted to mention and also add in is that. Uh, AU has what we call the BIAT, that is the Boosting Intra-African Trade. Now, um, that is also a very good instrument uh, that I think countries like Kenya, East Africa, and also uh, Somali, South African countries can use to, uh, you know, to, to fix the, the problem of disintegrated uh, kind of approach uh, to trade. Because anybody else, by every measure, would tell you that uh, the best approach to uh, harnessing the assets of the blue economy is actually using the regional approach, uh, you know, uh, and then the, within the regional approach, you don't just uh, we, we we don't you know the other models as I already said. Uh, uh, that that people always uh, look at it, uh, you know, look at uh, from a negative perspective, the maritime diplomacy that uh, can easily be harnessed. Uh, you know, when you put all this together, I think uh, uh, something can happen uh, positive in terms of enhancing the uh, the blue economy. But but the question is, uh, uh, go back again. again uh, how do we enhance this? We already have IORA. We already have the BIAT and other tools on the continent, how are we making use of them? Maybe uh, Professor Nanya can shed light on how that can be used as a, a dispute uh, resolution mechanism uh, for tensions that we continue to see on the continent. Um, if I may respond uh, to, to Francis. Um, so I've been quite involved with uh, the Indian Ocean Rim Association for about five years now, working on blue economy issues. And um, I led the academic group um, for the, the blue economy and the Indian Ocean Rim Association for two years. And one of the big debates was really around the issue of maritime diplomacy and safety and security. Iora, when it was um, established, um, in 1997, so it's been around for a long time, 
um, was not about uh, issues uh, uh, of peace and security. Uh, it was really around economic development and, um, you know, in, in sort of improving the the um, relations of, of countries around um, these these kinds of uh, economic growth issues. But the agenda is really moving strongly towards um, peace and security and talking about those kinds of issues within um, this Indian Ocean Rim Association, but it still remains uh, relatively controversial um, because there are some other bodies uh, such as um, the, the Naval, uh, Indian Ocean Naval uh, Institute, uh, where the navies are, are actually um, working together, but um, they, they don't necessarily always um, work with the Indian Ocean Rim Association. And there's a, so we try to steer away uh, from the whole issue of navies and rather look at how coast guards, for example, can um, uh, can can cooperate with one another uh, in in this in this regional way. So it's it's not a it's, it's a little bit of a fraught uh, discussion, but I think we're moving more and more to towards focusing on this because people realise that regional trade and growth is not going to be possible um, if we have a situation where where um, the oceans are unsafe um, and that there's there's not sufficient um, security disaster management and and those things that that would also um, come into this scenario I'll, um, I'll just ask uh, Dini uh, to give your uh, opinion on this I mean how is your government handling? conflicts or uh, I mean the, the 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 edge or the discussion between development and uh, protection do you have any policies in place in your government for that? okay thank you and uh, our government is trying to develop an uh, policies and regularities framework and yeah. also strengthening and enforcing the capacity and the effective of the uh, marine resources Mm -hmm. And also, uh, we are developing an, uh, security forces for the security and, and, and the safety of the marine. Also, to fight the illegal and uh, fishing. Uh, also, we are trying to develop an, uh, a policy for environment, pollution, and the dumping of the waste in the sea. Uh, so that is the main areas that our government is focusing. Okay. So... Uh, Nanya, like now, now that you have identified these some you know, some of these areas, how how do you see collaboration helping to develop uh, these areas? I mean, all all the twenty two IORA countries have something to do with the blue economy. Uh, I mean, I can just give a little bit of, of the Indian side, where mm -hmm. we have been looking at is uh, is definitely fisheries, aquaculture, and uh, marine ICT is again our focus area because of the IT industry that we have predominantly doing very well around the world. And uh, and then shipping, of course, India has a huge coastline, so shipping inland waterways is one of our focus areas as well. So these are some of the areas where we can bring in some, uh, what do you call that, understanding, know-how, technology to, mm -hmm. uh, to the rest of the developing world, I would say. And then probably vice versa, from South Africa, Kenya, Somalia, there must be something very interesting things happening where the rest of the countries should know about. So what would that be for you in South Africa? The great thing is we have the platform, as yeah. saying, you know, we have the regional platforms um, and including the, the African Union. So um, there, there's always a space to have these discussions and, and to share. Um, and countries do have their own strengths. Um, and they're able to to participate in in these engagements from their own positions of strength. Um, and I think that uh, each Iora country, the 22 member states, as I mentioned, um, has been contributing something of value. Um, I think the the UAE, for example, is, has really made huge strides in in terms of biotechnology, renewable energy, as well as uh, tourism. Yeah. But uh, unfortunately, as I say, that's that's kind of come to a dead 
dead standstill. Um, South Africa is is very strong in the area of, um, as I say, oil and gas exploration um, and developments around that, as, as well as uh, tourism and shipping. Um, and, and South Africa also has started to do something that's very important, and, um, and that is gender mainstreaming within um, these sectors. So making sure that women are entering the sectors um, and that they are contributing, uh, making their own contributions um, towards the sectors. Um, and in South Africa, very strongly in terms of um, actually shipping manufacturing um, is, is a big thing. So not only logistics, um, and as, as it's been said, you can only really leverage your economy if you use every single person um, that, that you can um, in order to do that. But so do that's you, something that we really feel we'd like to contribute towards the conversation. Um, and we've been doing that within the Indian Ocean Room Association. We also have a, a working group now for women's economic empowerment. Is there um, any other platform? I mean, is IORA the only platform for collaborations or is there any? No, no, not at all. So it's just an interesting platform because we also have eight dialogue partners. So dialogue partners are, are um, countries who are interested in the Indian Ocean. So um, the dialogue partners, first of all, they fund um, various initiatives uh, within IORA because they're relatively well-to-do countries. Uh, Aura is um, consisting mainly of developing countries as well as uh, least developing countries and uh, small island developing states. Um, any, program, any program in South Africa particularly? Any collaboration programs in South Africa with financing available? Um, well, yes. Uh, we, we are not in the greatest position um, to... to to make sure that, um, or at least to contribute financially, but we have very strong relationships with France, uh, China, Japan, Germany, um, and the US. And these countries uh, invest quite a bit, um, but we have to make sure obviously that they're investing um, in what South Africa is wanting to do and what is beneficial to South Africa. So this is where the maritime diplomacy issue comes in. Um, but the U.S. is, for example, investing a lot in uh, small and medium-sized businesses within the, within the maritime sector. China is investing a lot in ports um, and shipping throughout Africa, but also in South Africa as well as coastal um, coastal uh, socioeconomic zones um, and uh, France is, is very interested in, in developing trade. So you can see there that we work across the globe. I mean, we're not isolated in any way. Um, we work within the constraints of the United Nations um, Convention on the Law of the Sea um, and we, we are involved in, in other um, regional organizations as well as the Western Indian Ocean um, a Symposium that we are members of as well. Uh, as, and we bring these issues to whatever forum we're in. So BRICS would be an example. Um, South Africa is, an, is part of BRICS. And of course, the whole issue of um, the blue economy and uh, maritime diplomacy is now becoming embedded within BRICS. In fact, in the last um, meeting that was held in, in Moscow, because Russia is now chairing BRICS for this year, um, the whole issue of the blue economy came onto the table and each of the BRICS countries is very interested in developing sectors um, and you know, uh, Russia, for example, now is really wanting to look at the um, early warning systems and disaster risk management. As you could see, there was um, uh, Putin uh, declared a, a state of emergency because of the oil spills there. So everybody's affected by it, and uh, we can we can work in many ways um, around this. And we have overlap in terms of the the kinds of um, areas that we work in. Uh, so there's also a tension because um, there's so many regional organizations that um, they may have overlap overlapping or even um, conflicting ideologies or approaches to this. 
Um, but slowly but surely, we are learning from one another as to what is necessary. Um, and I think what is most necessary for the small island developing states at the moment is conservation. So the, the development of what we call um, blue carbon uh, bonds is a very interesting one uh, that encourages conservation and then um, communities who, for example, plant mangrove trees and conserve them would receive a certain amount of payment um, in order to do that from blue carbon bonds because mangroves absorb so much carbon dioxide from the air. So you can even make money from conservation um, and that is becoming um, really entrenched uh, in, in many countries, but in particular in the small island developing states. And it's being pushed um, a lot by Australia as, as one of the ways in which we can um, conserve and earn money at the same time. Yeah, okay. Yeah, doctor, you want to add uh, on to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so East Africa is a bit unique um, uh, if you compare it with the South African because of one factor, the, the, the insecurity and the potential or tensions that continue to grow. You know, the Kenyan coast has also been very insecure. I mean, quite a lot of insecurity issues uh, which the government continues to manage um, a bit effective, uh, but uh, we can't deny the fact that uh, the, the uniqueness of the Kenyan coast and the East Africa at large also lies in the pir piracy and you know all those other issues that affect trade and also the stability of the region. But in terms of collaboration, I think I think um, for us to uh, to do a proper uh, you know uh, mapping or understanding of uh, collaboration in my view uh, we can look at it in two ways one at at, at a sub regional level uh, where countries are creating synergy uh, for example in east africa uh, we've got the um, uh, you know development of uh, of ports you know mombasa lam um, uh, even uh, the Dar es Salaam. We've had a lot of Chinese and other partners also uh, doing quite a lot of development, you know, rather what you could call revamping the physical infrastructure uh, so that there is a connection between the inland and the coastal region. So that collaboration does not just play around East Africa, but it extends also to the Horn of Africa where you've got Ethiopia, Djibouti, Eritrea, South Sudan, and also countries in Great Lake region who have actually joined hands to ensure that uh, the physical infrastructure are developed and established to connect to the coast because a number of countries in the region are landlocked and they only depend on Kenya and Tanzania to access the global market. So that one is in progress. Now the challenge would be, how do you harness this synergy at a, at a sub-regional level uh, to the, how do you scale it up to the global level? I think we've got a bit of opportunities. For example, um, at the Kenyan coast, we've got uh, British, we've got uh, US uh, bases, military bases. And that is a very good opportunity for what you call, what you could call military diplomacy uh, because they already have an interest, is a base for them, um, building it into uh, you know, a hub, an integrated hub of economy, military and diplomacy is something that can be done and uh, it is also um, possible to achieve. But we, we've got also, um, of course, the China and India uh, have a very uh, long history of collaboration in Navy um, with, with Kenya and, and I believe also other countries. And so uh, in terms of capacity building, I know India and uh, India is a bit advanced when it comes to coastal guards. Uh, when it comes to something that perhaps uh, they can enhance uh, and putting into the, the factor of blue economy. Because Those collaborations have existed. I'm just waiting. Uh, I think we. Especially. 
Dr. Onditi, we are not able to hear you clearly. So, I mean, I'll just go to Dini and ask him uh, if, if there are any programs in, in Somalia that are being looked into for collaboration. Uh, okay, thank you. And uh, our government is planning and, uh, to make uh, development in terms of collaboration, mm. in terms of uh, coordination, including an information collection of the oceans, also data sharing, also, we are planning uh, the, for sharing of knowledge uh, and technical knowledge also, and uh, to develop a capacity development for a uh, blue economy. Also, we are planning uh, and for investments and uh, also in more advanced equipment like modern vessels and modern shipping gears. Okay, so that's what we are, are sharing to the other neighborings. Thank you. Okay. okay. Okay, so I will I'll just go to one of the questions that we are receiving. Uh, Jaimal uh, writes about, and maybe uh, Narnia can look at this, or, or, or all of you can answer this probably. Uh, the IORA Concord include, included and adopted the UN resolution defining the Indian Ocean as zone of peace and security in respect of sustainable development. Should this principle be workshopped specifically? Hi, Jamal. <laughs> um, yes, it should be workshopped further. Um, this uh, resolution comes from the 19, early 1970s uh, from the United Nations, um, declaring the Indian Ocean um, a zone of peace. That means a lot. Um, and uh, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of resistance around this because it's got uh, to do with uh, nuclear non proliferation as well in the region um, and so there we would have to be very careful about the kinds of naval bases that are built on East African coasts um, and the the kinds of um, tensions that could arise so the the concept of a zone of peace has really been on ice for the last 50 years um, and we do need to revisit it. And we need to revisit it even if it is an uncomfortable conversation to have. Um, and I think maybe there could be a level of mediation from some of our uh, more active dialogue partners um, around how we could conceptualize um, this zone of peace in a way that would, um, would appeal to the region as a whole, but of course, IORA is a consensus-based organization. So if you have one country uh, not agreeing with the approach that we take with the zone of peace in the region, then we, we're deadlocked. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask our guests, whoever are listening in, if they wish to speak or if they wish to uh, drop a question, please do that. And uh, I will be very happy because last 10 minutes, I can I can definitely uh, pull in some of those questions that are coming in. Uh, just to round up uh, just the final things, um, I had a couple of things still uh, in my mind, at least is, uh, do you have an investment promotion board or what, what, what is the name of that kind of an entity uh, if there exists one and what kind of technologies uh, they would be looking at uh, for now and do you have any good stories in your in your own countries to for the rest of the world to to kind of uh, I mean, look at i mean either way i'm looking both sides i'm looking something that you would need now some technologies that you would need so how who, who should they come to in the first place that's the question number one and the other question would be what is that you you believe you have excellent uh, things that the other people uh, other countries should should know Narnia. Uh, me again. Okay, we, so we're quite good with diplomacy in South Africa. Um, yeah. I think we've still maintained a, a relatively uh, high regard um, nationally, uh, continentally, uh, regionally, and internationally as diplomats. Um, and so the, the area of uh, maritime diplomacy is something that I think we can really 
um, attain to and to facilitate um, these these discussions um, and develop new ways of, of thinking about um, the blue economy. We could also contribute a lot towards uh, women's empowerment and how we can bring women into the blue economy. And we've done quite a lot of work around that and we've been quite successful in that area and we could share that knowledge okay. as well. Um, so, you know, we do, we do need to do a mapping exercise of some sort um, and, and that's an ongoing exercise within the region. I mean, where are the strengths? Um, but I do also think that um, our, we, we're quite developed in terms of um, marine, marine uh, spatial planning. Um, and we've got new legislation around this and um, how to do it in a way that um, is best uh, suited towards both the ecosystems as well as uh, the areas that, uh, that, that we are entitled to exploit. Um, and so I think our, our, our work in terms of marine spatial planning and the law and governance side of it um, is an area that we, we are very strong in. What we could learn from is definitely we could learn more around uh, marine ICT from India. Um, and that is uh, an, something I would really encourage um, government to explore further. Yeah. And we should really be focusing more on um, uh, ocean renewable energy. But of course, that's, that's very cost intensive. Uh, we had a terrible drought um, in the Western Cape and in Cape Town a couple of years ago. Um, and we had desalination um, equipment that uh, w was sent to us by other countries, but we didn't have the ability to manufacture them ourselves. So um, those, those are the kinds of things that we need to consider in terms of either learning to do it ourselves or um, receiving the kinds of investment needed to, to develop in, in that area, for example. Yeah. Dini, you want to add anything before I go to Dr. Onditi for the last words? Dini, you want to say uh, what would be something that you would need immediately, some technologies that you would need immediately in which areas? Yeah, and, uh, the areas that we are focusing to get is uh, marine ICT. Yeah, okay. Also, and uh, fishing industries. Okay. In the, in the terms of our oceans. Okay. And do you have an investment promotion board or something in your country to look into this? No, but we are, we are planning to develop now. Okay. Okay. So maybe we, we can get in touch with you in the first instance and then you could direct us uh, where, where to take those investments. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, okay. Yes. okay. Yeah. Dr. Onditi, uh, anything uh, similar happening in your country? Yeah. Um, I hope you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Okay. Now, I think if you ask me one of the opportunities that um, Kenya presents to the world in terms yes. of blue economy, yes. uh, first of all, um, what I said, the military diplomacy, you know, Kenya, the Kenyan cost is, is not big as compared to Somalia or Dar es Salaam, but it's very active in terms of global activities. Um, and, and don't forget that uh, majority of countries in East African region are landlocked. And therefore, Kenya can, uh, you know, there is a lot of potential for uh, what we call the re-export. You know, Kenya can create a re-export hub, you know, something similar to what you see in Singapore, what you see in UA, UAE. And, yeah, and I think India also does that to some extent. Yes. But I also wanted to say that uh, within that uh, space of re-export, helping the landlocked countries who sometimes are very vulnerable, because sometimes when there are, you know, security tensions and geopolitical challenges, these countries might suffer a lot. There is something called uh, what we call the sensor, you know, uh, the sensor technology growth, where you try to connect the demand because of its already existing facilities and technology for, for export. If that can be enhanced, I think we shall be 
of course, promoting and enhancing trade, but at the same time, we shall be achieving what uh, Professor Nanya said, you know, the balance between uh, maritime security and economy. Uh, if we do that, I think that will be important. But what I would, uh, uh, what I would suggest and encourage in investing in East Africa and in Kenya particularly, the, the big data analytics, uh, it, it can be a game changer, particularly uh, when you look at the big logistics, the, the, the you know voluminous logistics that a country like Kenya would experience uh, when they're handling the more than six landlocked countries in the region. It is something that uh, we can we can maybe get um, from uh, other countries like India, China, uh, and and others as well. So big data tech, uh, you know analytics, you know it, it's an investment that uh, I would see I would foresee in future uh, creating a demand in Kenya so that other countries can also benefit from the expansiveness and the military uh, diplomacy that the country enjoys. Thank you. Thanks. I think we are just around the clock and uh, just right of time. We have finished most of the almost all the topics that we had to answer. And I'm sure the post COVID scenario that I see, uh, hopefully this ends very soon. And then we, are, we have to run these engines, economic engines back for creating jobs and running the, you know, getting back to the economy post COVID session and so on. And probably blue economy will play a very big role in that. But before that, I believe all this homework that we are talking of is still on the table that needs to be done. Uh, hopefully it will, uh, will give us some time to finish that. And maybe uh, the next decade is the oceans decade. So 2021, we see business in the, uh, in the ocean economy as well as sustainability and your regional problems on and on security all all uh, i mean are answered to some extent or at least you should begin those discussions uh, after this uh, the scenario of covid-19 is over i would like to thank all of you to join uh, join me today on this webinar i think uh, it was really in, more interesting for me to know what's happening in africa and you know that more in europe because this topic in europe is very much developed in Africa, I don't hear so many things happening, what's happening around there. So thank you very much. The next webinar that I'll be hosting will be next month. Uh, probably I'm trying to get uh, the island nations. Uh, they have a very different challenge, I believe, compared to most of us. So let's see what, what when, that, when that happens. Uh, I'm, I'm getting on uh, kind of connecting with a few speakers on that uh, topic as well. So I would say thank you very much. Once again, and uh, the link to this particular webinar session will be available on our YouTube channel, and I will be also sharing the link on our on our uh, social media sites and our uh, website as well. So, thank you, and have a nice uh, evening. <laughs>